Tanley is a technology entrepreneur and is founder of CEO of Emative Life Sciences. Tan was named uh, Young Australian of the Year in 1998, but was voted one of Australia's 30 most successful women under 30 in that same year. Tan has been widely featured as a technology entrepreneur, named Fast Company's Most Influential Woman in Technology 2010, and Forbes, Forbes Names You Need to Know 2011. Tan has been honoured by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader since 2009. Tan appears in association with Vision Stream. Tan, you're in business. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I've actually always been fascinated by the human brain. But when I first had the idea and the inspiration to start working in the area of brain research, I encompassed, uh, just encountered so many barriers. Uh, and this was a big problem. You know, Brain observation, measurement, and imaging systems were really cumbersome to use and cost prohibitive. And uh, you know, brain research at the time could only be uh, really participated in by a very small elite subset within our community. And even though these people were obviously experts in the field, I couldn't help but wonder at what the possibilities might be if somehow this field could be opened up uh, and so it would, could be somehow a lot more closer to the way that the internet and the web fostered innovation by its very nature and design. I thought that brain research could also benefit from far more open framework. So the internet's strength lies in the decentralization of control by letting intelligence and innovation happen at the edges rather than at the middle of the network. And the web you know, its central hallmark lies in the fact that it's an open platform, an open environment in which anyone could share information, connect with anyone else anywhere in the world, and they could work independently or they could work together. And this is, these central themes, these central ideas make it really impactful and profound in its, its reach and uh, revolution. So the, these are the key ingredients, openness, connectivity, and democratization. So I thought that this would be something that we could do with brain research. Now, innovation actually really relies on people who dare to dream and yet are foolish enough to try and make these dreams come true. And foolishness is actually a very key ingredient in both innovation and entrepreneurship. I learned this speaking to the myriad of experts who at the time told me that it couldn't be possible. It simply wasn't possible. And risk-taking is the other key ingredient, which is often missed, because people simply don't want to fail. And so as experts, people often think that they know what isn't possible. And so my foolishness and my willingness to accept failure allowed me and my team to create something that wasn't possible before. For thousands of years, we've wanted to look inside the human mind. The human brain weighs just three pounds, but it's one of the most advanced organs in the body. It has an estimated 100 billion nerve cells called neurons and many more support cells. And in fact, our stunning brain power results not so much from the raw bulk, but rather from the way in which our neurons are actually connected and interact with each other how the quadrillion connections actually form and dissolve, and how distant groups of cells start to spark away in unison and then shift and then coordinate with other subsets of neurons. So this is the challenge that uh, we wanted to address. And so with that, I'd actually like to showcase for you what we've been able to develop, because it's easy to talk about. It's, it's a lot better if you can actually see what we've been able to do. So I'd like to invite on stage uh, Jeff McKellar. And what, what you see here is basically a very simple device. It's very lightweight. And Jeff, if you could put this on. So what this is, is a EEG or electroencephalography. And uh, essentially, our brain, when the, the neurons in our brain interact, the chemical reaction emits an electrical impulse, which can be measured. 
Generally, if you have ever taken an EEG reading before, it takes a 30-minute segment or with a technician or with an expert technician, but in this case, it doesn't require any specialist knowledge from the user at all. And as you can see, it only takes a few minutes to put on and for the signals to settle. And what we're seeing now here is a real-time trace of the electrical signals that's streaming from Jeff's brain. So what else can we do with this sort of system? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what we're able to do with this system. And the idea is that for many years we've wanted to better understand the structure and function of our brain. You know, we've wanted to get a better insight into how we think, work and learn. And we've also had the dream and the fascination of maybe one day being able to control things just with our minds. And so that was one of the things that we wanted to do with this technology. So what I'd like to do is show you how the system actually works. And what I'll do is to start off by creating a brand new user. So the system doesn't actually know Jeff yet. And so what we've done is we've created a brand new profile so that it can learn how Jeff thinks about particular action. So we'll start first um, by taking a neutral signal. And the reason why we're doing this is because everyone's brain is very different. And so by taking a, a baseline state of Jeff's brain, we can compare it to everybody else's brain. So we'll accept this training. And so now what we'd like to do is maybe select an action. Jeff, choose something you think you can do. OK, lift. So the idea is, uh, so we'll apply that. So now what we need to do is we need to show the system how Jeff actually thinks about lifting an object simply with his mind. The first time, nothing will actually happen because the system has no idea how he thinks about lifting. So keep thinking lift. And you'll see the progress bar scroll across the screen as it's observing his, the signals from his brain. OK. So let's give it a try and let's see if... Okay. So you can see that, you know, with AI and with really sophisticated pattern recognition algorithms, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty fun, huh? So let's try, and again, now we're, we're going to have to do the same process, show the system how to pull. So ready, set, go. OK. All right. Very good. <laughs> and he can obviously do either pull or lift at his discretion just using his mind. So as you can see, it's quite... <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. That's also well, stay with us because we're going to try and show something else uh, in a moment as well. So as you can imagine, with this sort of technology, there are so many possible application areas, you know, from learning, uh, such as aiding in understanding cognitive development disorders, or <laughs> in monitoring <laughs> children with uh, ADHD, or even in, okay, if I can switch back to um, my presentation, please. You know, we could also use it to understand consumer behavior and gain insights into uh, consumer preferences for market research uh, and advertising. Here's a, a quick example. So what we're doing here is we're taking, we're using eye tracking to uh, enable us to see where you're looking and we're also looking at the brain's response in relation to uh, the stimulus. And this is a much more objective way uh, to understand consumer preferences in, in that sort of scenario. Uh, the other one is also in just simply brain-computer interface applications. So as you can imagine, this can be very easily applied to something as trivial as being able to realize the fantasy of magic in a computer game, or something that's far more life-changing, such as being able to control an electric wheelchair. Um, and here is just a quick example of something that's not too distant in the future. Just by thinking two different things, you can control the computer. In our first experiment, the test subject uses the sensor cap to give commands to our autonomous car. 
The car is equipped with video cameras, radars, and laser sensors that provide the car with a full three-dimensional view of its surroundings. The car drives automatically to the corner. At the intersection, the test subject orders the car to take a right. The car continues automatically. The small frame on the upper right shows the laser sensor readings. The frame in the lower right shows the brain command for the car. After a small delay, the car turns around the corner, as you can see. For a second experiment, we trained the computer to recognize four brain patterns. The test subject can steer the car to the left or the right. He can also accelerate or decelerate the car. Of course, you should never try this at home. For safety reasons, we tested in a large open space at Tempelhof Airport in Berlin. You can see here the test subject incrementing or decrementing the steering angle. There's a slight delay between the brain command and the steering action. Remember, this is just a proof of concept. The task here was to show free driving by detecting brain patterns. So where do you think we could go from here? And we've spoken, we've heard lots of speakers talk about the fact that we often think linearly. But if you think about it, if we apply an exponential uh, curve to the equation, if we had a, just a simple process that just divided every day, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, within a month we're at a billion. So this is how we need to predict, as we've heard, the future of technology around us. And we've obviously experienced the accelerating pace of change that's been brought about by exponential technologies. We've also witnessed the acceleration of computational power with Moore's law, which has really transformed everything from social to economic. Human brain scanning technology is also experiencing this exponential improvement and advancement. You know, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and bandwidth of brain scanning systems are actually doubling every year. So if we leverage this along with internet connectivity, with the ability to process complex computational bioinformatics through the availability of cloud computing, and we use mobile devices, then it opens up new possibilities for the future of health and wellness. We believe that there is a tremendous opportunity today in democratizing brain imaging. By making brain observation measurement easier and yet at higher resolutions, and by offering a platform for more affordable and open participation, we can really extend the potential of this new technology. These headsets today have a reach in over 90 countries worldwide, which means that we now have the ability to rapidly accumulate data on the precise characteristics and the dynamics of the constituent parts and systems of the brain. And this is really, really important in allowing us to um, move the needle further. One of my favorite examples, which is what I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, of exponential technology is the mobile phone. Amazingly, the, mobile phone, the proliferation of mobile phones and the internet in even some of the most disadvantaged parts of the world can be turned to unexpected uses. Today, there's this tremendous amount of understanding and growing awareness of the personal and economic burden associated with mental and neurological disorders. But whilst this need is becoming recognized, solutions will depend on innovative new technology that enable inexpensive measurement of functional brain data. And wireless access, in particular, will be a particular boon for developing countries where many people do not have connectivity by wire or cable, but they do have it wirelessly. So with that, I'd like to show you the latest of what we're working on. And uh, what you see here is basically just a portable brain scanner. And uh, this is taking a reading directly from Jeff's brain. Um, and as he moves his head around, the, br the brain will, will turn and scan. And so now, with this sort of technology, we're able to really change the way in which we collect EEG data. Now it can be collected anywhere in the world. It can be sent over mobile phone networks and the internet to central servers where it can be accessed by physicians and medical researchers. Now you can actually do so much more now <laughs> um, than, than we could have done in the past. Uh, and so where, what can we do with this? Well, there are, there are so many 
medical conditions that we can address with this sort of technology, from epilepsy to Alzheimer's disease to Parkinson's disease, dementia, autism. We can also understand neurocognitive processes such as、uh, executive functioning, attention, language,、uh, emotion, bipolar disorders, or we could even use it to study the effects of head injuries, cerebrovascular disease. The list just goes on. And so, the most exciting thing about this is that the possibilities are endless because we're just at the beginning of this journey. I'd like to close by、um, mentioning just a phrase that's very popular by, that was coined by this,、uh, a guy in Silicon Valley, Alan Kay. We've talked about how hard it is to predict the future, but you know the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Andy,、awesome. thank you.